Uh, welcome everybody. I'm really glad that we are finally going to have this event on women in Central Asia today. Uh, I will give you a few words of background and then I will introduce the speakers of today. I'm very glad that we have all the speakers here and I'm glad that we see that there is a wide interest in this task. So some background first. The Central Asian region is discussed usually from the perspective of geopolitical importance and political authoritarianism. But recently it became also known through feminist activism. Several countries of the regions have signed international documents on gender equality, but at the same time, the region is known both through preservation of discrimination against women in many spheres of life, and also the new conservative turn using ideas of natural femininity for purposes of national building. The panel is a continuation of the online workshop on post-Soviet women, ways to empowerment that took place at IRIS on September 10 and 11. Unfortunately, our speakers couldn't participate then, so this is why we organize an extra event. Uh, the purpose of this workshop, which is a continuation of the former workshop, was to gather scholars from different disciplines and countries to discuss new developments with respect to the situation of women and consequences of the new conservative developments with respect to the situation of women and consequences of the new conservative movements on gender equality in Russia, not the least, and Eurasia as well. And the idea behind this was actually that some of us, uh, Julia Graskova, uh, Vladi, Slava Vladimirova, and Helene Kalvek and myself, were discussing that we really had to do something on this issue that we felt were very important. And I was then looking at the book by Mary Buckley, uh, published some 25 years ago, all, almost five years, 25 years ago. It was published in 1997 on women in post-Soviet Russia. And uh, we thought we have to make an update more or less, but we are not going to, to uh, be so strict about regions and so on. And she was neither. So we are not really attempting to cover all the different countries. There are 15 post-Soviet countries, but we, we have the aim to get uh, contributions from all different angles of, of the post-Soviet area. And uh, this is sort of the background and the aim is to, to publish a book on this issue with contributions from Russia and Eurasia, including from Central Asia. So today we have uh, four uh, papers, you can say four, four presentations, but we have six participants because we have two co-authors for, for one, for two of the presentations. So I will just start by introducing the first speaker. I find the paper here, the right paper. And it is... Huh? And we have the first speaker is Kalim Trusisbek. Uh, he is an independent researcher based in Almaty. He Hello. received yes. Okay. Uh, I hope. Mary, I'm sorry to interrupt. I could. Uh... Could I ask everyone to mute their microphones, please? 
uh, because somebody, uh, it's difficult to tell, I can't see who, but thank you. And make sure that, that you're muted um, if you're not presenting, okay? Thank you so much. Sarah and Marie, please continue. Okay, so my presentation continues. Well, first uh, I would like to say that Shushi Beck is, is, he has received his PhD from Ankara University, Faculty of Political Science. In, in recent years, he has engaged in projects related to the de development of human rights in post-Soviet geography, discrimination of human rights based on ethnic and religious grounds, modern ideational trends in the Muslim world, and building inclusive institutions. And the, his co-writer is Janar Nagayeva, and she is an independent researcher also based in, in Almaty. Nagaeva completed her master's at Leeds Business School in the UK. In recent years, Janar has been engaged in research on women's rights, children's rights, the models of education, and ecologically friendly development. Our second presenter is Gul Gulnara Ibrahiva. She's a gender specialist, PhD in sociology. And she, Gulnara is also the founder of a principal investigator of the PIL private research consultancy firm based in Bishkek, Kyrgyzstan. Gulnara is the author of numerous reports and papers and for instance, uh, publications based on nation, nation building in Kyrgyzstan and uh, the fragile power of migration, the needs of rights of women and girls from Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan who are affected by migration. Okay, so that's the second speaker. The third speaker is Nazgul Mingisheva. Nazgul has a PhD from Department of Sociology, Eurasian National University, Nur Sultan, Kazakhstan. And the fourth presentation also involves two presenters, Janar Temir Biakova. Uh, Candidate of Economic Sciences, Associate Professor, Advisor to the President of Almaty Management University. Awarded by the Nusultan Nazarbayev Foundation for the best research and achievements in field of science and technology among young scientists. And she has published a lot of scientific works, for example, on gender equality and empowerment and women in the context of Marnique, um, well, National Idea, the project of welfare state in Kazakhstan. Gender equality issues in Kazakhstan, women in the economic, political and sociocultural sphere. And her co-writer is Sirik B. Sembayev. I'm not sure if I pronounced right. It's perfect. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Also a sociologist research fellow. He has a P he is a PhD candidate at the El Gumilov Eurasia National University. And he has also worked on on topics like gender equality issues in Kazakhstan. Okay, and then finally we have our, we have a discussant also today. Welcome Nathan. Nathan Light is based at the Department for Anthropology at Uppsala University and he holds a PhD and he is a senior researcher I know he has done most of his research on Kyrgyzstan, but you could add if you want. But now it's time to start. So I give the word to Galim and uh, to his co-writer. 
Thank you. Okay, uh, can I start? Yes, so it's Galim and Janar Nagaeva who will start. Okay. I just said that I will, we have 15 minutes and I will remind you a little bit for uh -huh. 15 minutes, okay? From now. Galim, uh, mm -hmm. shall I share your presentation now? Uh, please, our presentation. The one in uh, PowerPoint or the PDF version? Galim, which uh, one do yeah, you want? Uh, which one more? Okay, doesn't matter. Uh, which I is think. more appropriate? Yeah, yeah, okay, doesn't matter. Just a second. Give me a second to share it. Yeah, uh, just a kind of introduction. Um, uh, our research is still ongoing. Uh, ideas are very tentative, uh, maybe very debatable. Uh, to some extent, uh, we may seem um, as maybe extreme, extremist in our ideas. Yeah, I admit. Uh, excuse me, can you hear me? Uh, yes. The voice is okay? Yes. Uh, okay. Um, um, yeah, personally, I am um, very much interested in uh, both concepts, uh, human rights and uh, neoliberal capitalism. Um, again, uh, repeat, uh, I want to repeat the kind of introduction to our presentation. Um, um, our approach is based on uh, a philosophical conception of human rights, which is a liberal. And it may seem very odd to critique neoliberal capitalism, neoliberal uh, capitalism, uh, neoliberal, neoliberalism uh, from the position of liberalism. Yeah, uh, uh, it's not a contradiction. Yeah, in our view, it's uh, very much logical because uh, neoliberal capitalism or neoliberal, uh, neoliberalism um, to great extent violates human rights. Yeah. Uh, our position is liberal based on uh, philosophical moral conception of human rights. Uh, please, uh, next slide. Wait a second. No. Yeah, uh, in our uh, research, um, main concepts are women and human rights, uh, retraditionalization, authentic culture, traditional religion, um, uh, neoliberal capitalism, demise of social states, commercialization, commodification, neglected social rights, vulnerability of children, women. And um, uh, we want to make um, uh, a claim. Yeah, it may seem a big claim, but we, we argue that uh, there's a kind of intera interaction, even uh, tentative uh, synthesis emerged between these two concepts, two notions. They may seem very contradictory, uh, retraditionalization and capitalism, but uh, according to our research, there's a kind of interaction, even synthesis. And um, uh, I, I want to present our ideas, yeah. Please, next slide. Uh, if uh, if to analyze the retraditionalization um, from broad perspective, uh, it's very complex. Yeah, first, um, according to our conceptualization, it's something uh, both top down and from the bottom to top process. Uh, political elites in Central Asian countries, uh, yeah, if take Kazakhstan for example, uh, political elites very much enthusiastic about uh, retraditionalization. It's a kind of, uh, it's a political agenda. Uh, yeah, it uh, provides political elites with uh, new forms of uh, meaning making uh, to, to create foundations uh, of, of, of the Kazakhstani government, Kazakhstani statehood. And the uh, German scholars uh, uh, wrote about this in Central Asian survey. Uh, it's, uh, 
also uh, their analysis. But uh, at the same time, uh, retraditionalization is a uh, grassroots phenomenon. It's very much popular among people. Yeah, it's very much popular in society. Uh, even, yeah, it can be argued that um, retraditionalization is perceived as a national ideology, the revival of authentic culture. Um, return to roots yeah, after uh, Soviet period uh, of mangertization. Yeah, it's a, a kind of uh, revival of national authentic culture after the period of being Mangurt. Yeah, Mangurt is a specific concept uh, popularized by Chinggis Aitmatov, which means a person uh, who lost uh, his her memory or uh, in our understanding is a person who lost his human qualities. But conservatives now in Central Asian countries, in our view, misuse this concept. For example, a person who don't, uh, who, who doesn't speak native language is labeled as Mankurt. Yeah, in my view, it's uh, wrong because uh, Mankurt is something different. Okay, uh, on the other hand, uh, retraditionalization is perceived as a process of de-Sovietization. Uh, uh, yeah, if in some, uh, you know, in Baltic countries, for example, uh, democratization is perceived as de-Sovietization in Central Asian countries, uh, retraditionalization You got muted. Kalim, can you hear us? Okay, Galim is back. You have to unmute yourself, Galim. Yeah, uh, I, I think connection was lost. We lost you there. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, in fact, the retraditionalization appears as a process of recreating archaic and patriarchal social norms. And to some extent, uh, retraditionalization legitimizes authoritarian regimes and non-democratic non social norms and practices. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a well-known fact. Uh, this is the next slide. Um, but to great, uh, maybe, uh, frustration of uh, Central Asian people, <laughs> our native intelligentsia, the claims about cultural authenticity, the claims about real retraditionalization is only mirage because, um, yeah, it's impossible to detach culture and religion from history. Yeah, as uh, Afshari, it's a very uh, well-known American-Iranian human rights uh, scholar. Uh, yeah, seeking cultural authenticity in one's cultural legacy is, is, uh, um, is in, in, uh, not authentic itself. It's a mirage, it's, a, uh, it's not real. It's a fake, uh, excuse me for using these concepts. And uh, if, if to come our <clears throat> uh, main analysis, uh, in Central Asia, retraditionalization became infused with capitalism. Yeah, uh, retraditionalization has gone uh, hand in hand with capitalist modernity. And um, uh, what we have now in Central Asian countries under the label of traditions or return to traditions, revival of national religion, cultural legacy, it's something very much infused, permitted with capitalism. And uh, uh, it was something very, in my view, natural because after the collapse of Soviet Union, marketization reforms were imposed. And according to my colleague, uh, Asel Rustemova, Asel Tutumlu, she analyzed um, political regimes and legitimacy of political regimes in Central Asia. Uh, according to her analysis, uh, neoliberal reforms were much more radical in the global south, yeah, including for Soviet countries. Um, yeah, the marketization reforms uh, won't experience to the scale in the European countries, even in the USA. Uh, please, next slide. Yeah, 
Yeah, if uh, very briefly uh, to touch neoliberal capitalism, it's uh, uh, today it's a dominant approach in the global political economy. Yeah, uh, yeah. I want to highlight that this um, notion has its own philosophy and morality. Yeah, normally critics, um, Marxist critics or anarchist uh, critics, say I am very sympathetic to them, uh, but they miss a very important point. Uh, neoliberal, neoliberal capitalism cannot be, shouldn't be described as immoral. Yeah, it has its own morality. Yeah, first, it accepts that uh, human is fully rational, profit-seeking, um, uh, gaining maximum productivity is one of the main aims. Uh, free market is seen as panacea to all problems, and uh, austerity policies of all forms are accepted, are welcomed, are promoted. And the results, we have uh, commercialization, commodification of human life, monetized relationships. A very interesting research was done by uh, Rustam Jan Urimboev. Uh, he is Uzbek Swedish scholar. He analyzed um, uh, wedding ceremonies in Fergana Valley. And his analysis uh, argues that this ceremony is, is a mixture of ethnic culture and capitalism. Uh, uh, please, next slide. Uh, and uh, why to hit about neoliberal capitalism? Yeah, uh, if uh, to come specifically to our topic, women's rights, uh, neoliberal capitalism is gender biased. Yeah, because be uh, because despite of of its claims, of its all claims about freedoms, about development of human rights, uh, neoliberal capitalism is very much detrimental to women, women human rights and children's rights. Uh, not to mention disability rights, because the main aim is to get maximum productivity. Uh, we can observe feminization of poverty uh, because social programs uh, were at least diminished, maximum eliminated completely. Um, also, objectification of women's body also can be observed. Um, it's a natural result, logical result of, uh, of the development of neoliberal capitalism. Yeah, as I mentioned before, uh, it's an analysis of Asil Tutumlu, yeah, probably one of the most radical neoliberal reforms, marketization reforms were done in the uh, global south. And one of the results is the rentier oligarchic systems. Uh, yeah, please, next slide. Uh, yeah, it's uh, a kind of our conclusion, a main idea and uh, conclusion. Uh, uh, we can talk about interaction or synthesis between retraditionalization and liberalism, neoliberalism. Uh, uh, first uh, manifestation, it's an uh, image of hard working in office, but obedient and serving all her in-laws in her home wom woman. Or uh, maybe not uh, her in-laws, but family members. It's an uh, unpaid work uh, at home and hard working um, and uh, hard working office. Yeah, it's a very interesting combination, but it's first image. Uh, another image is um, uh, penetration of capitalism to traditions and even to religiosity. Example is a polygamy, uh, the solidification of gender roles. Uh, even, yeah, excuse me, uh, the, phenomenon, the phenomenon like human trafficking and prostitution. Um, please, next slide. Um, yeah, uh, interesting case of polygamy. Yeah, polygamy is uh, practiced in, uh, in all Central Asian countries. And the, in Kazakhstan, it's, uh, it's uh, a double, double, double life or uh, yeah, informal life of many, many socially prosperous or economically prosperous uh, men. It's not uh, necessarily religious. And, uh, and why? Um, yeah, Islamic, conservative Islamic interpretations provide good legitimation, good legit legitimization for this practice. But it's a kind of, um, uh, it's a manifestation of a material success, well-being, a commodification of social status. And uh, it's a combination of uh, religiosity, traditions, and uh, capitalism. Um, yeah, it's our 
and maybe tentative idea, tentative analysis. Uh, please, the next slide. Excuse me, Galim, could you please wrap up in about two minutes? Uh, okay, I am finishing. Okay, Just, good. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's conclusion. Um, yeah, to analyze the situation concerning women's rights, it's important to see uh, the interaction, even the synthesis between retraditionalization and neoliberalization. They are seemingly oxymoronic concepts, but at the close inspection, they are very much interrelated to each other. Uh, the boundaries are very much blurred between past and present traditions, traditions and capitalism, between local Central Asian culture and global neoliberal capitalism. And uh, I think women's rights is a very critical indicator in, uh, in this kind of analysis of, uh, of all relevant social phenomena, whether it's retraditionalization, uh, religiosity, the emergence of uh, religios uh, religiosity, capitalism, etc. Uh, okay, that's all. Um, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. That was very interesting. Thank you. Okay, we go to the next speaker, who is Gulnara Ibrayeva, uh, and she will talk on the political economy of domestic violence in Kyrgyzstan during the COVID-19 pandemic lockdown. Please, the, the word is yours, Gulnara. Thank you so much. Uh, first of all, I would like to th thank you for having me today here. It's my uh, honor to speak in front of you virtually, but uh, anyway, uh, my presentation is dedicated to the wife's abuse in Kyrgyzstan and pandemic of violence during lockdown this year. But uh, as you see in the title, it is speaking about domestic violence. And I will explain why. Uh, of course, I know well how different are terms, uh, domestic violence and wife abuse. Uh, under the uh, term um, uh, de definition of domestic violence, I understand the international infliction of physical and or mental harm uh, and suffering to family members, as well as the read uh, of such actions, coercion, deprivation of personal freedom. And wife abuse I define as any act which is intended to physically or emotionally harm that is taken against a woman uh, by her male partner, regardless of the current legal or domestic status of their relationship. It is, in fact, gender-based violence. And the difference uh, in definitions based on differentiation of two distinct bodies in theories on the issue, a feminist perspective and a general family violence perspective. Being a feminist perspective, uh, of course, I do not assume that it is homogeneous one a theoretical approach. It is a set of different, very different um, um, approaches and by general family violence perspective, I also understand the variety of uh, social theories starting from system um, uh, analysis uh, um, to probably uh, popular now biological infection uh, explanation uh, of uh, violation, uh, violence. So, uh, my position, uh, I would like to manifest from the very beginning, is feminist one. So, but um, speaking further about theoretical frame, I uh, focus um, my explanation on the um, Galtung's violence uh, triangle. Uh, probably everyone is... Um, very familiar with this and I would like to mention that um, a core a statements um, starting points of this uh, theoretical approach are violence is a product of the existing structures in society and we can dis uh, distinguish direct violence, structural and cultural violence. 
While direct violence is visible, structural and cultural violence are not uh, overfly visibly in society. Sometimes this triangle is um, uh, like demonstrated as iceberg. Galton suggests that these three forms of violence feed and reinforce each other. And um, why actually um, having this uh, feminist position and using this um, Galtung's um, theoretical frame, I use uh, the definition domestic violence. Let me tell you an anecdotal story that happened recently in my country. During the discussion meeting of the National Anti-Violence Against Women Network Unite, the state representative from gender machinery very seriously warned participants not to use the term gender-based violence. Because, uh, because in the legislation, there is the, the definition family violence or domestic violence. After continuation of discussion, the state servant just left the meeting as a protest. So I'm speaking now the same language as the state is understanding and uh, define, uh, because I would like to use this research as a social action, and I would like to develop on this base the policy brief and lobby the governmental structures uh, for institu uh, institutional, uh, institutional uh, changes. So, um, speaking a uh, few words about um, do, um, domestic violence uh, study in Kyrgyzstan, because um, we do not use really uh, violence abuse uh, as definition. So, uh, there are a few research where um, um, the focus is domestic violence prevalence uh, or um, a researcher uh, trying to identify specific features of aggressors or uh, victims of survivors. Very few research are uh, done uh, with focus on the uh, gender stereotypes and social norms which constitute the cultural violence. And the aim of my research is to examine the linkages between uh, wife abuse or domestic violence um, uh, as uh, state a thing and structural processes in the country. I um, developed uh, following research questions. Why the domestic violence, meaning uh, violence abuse, is reproducing and um, the proportion of uh, homicides as a result of domestic violence is growing? Why the measures of state and non-state actors are not affecting the prevalence of domestic violence? and why lockdown brings a wave of domestic violence pandemic. So, first of all, um, I would like to um, say about um, current uh, situation uh, in uh, this sphere and um, try to uh, show what the numbers tell us about domestic violence. You can see that um, we have um, obvious tendency um, from 2012, I would say, um, of uh, growing uh, of domestic violence complaints. And women uh, in all these uh, complaints, um, they are 90 or 95 percent of victims. Um, the growing uh, also numbers of protection orders issued by uh, courts and uh, Ministry of Internal Affairs. But at the same time, we have uh, those um, aggressors who are uh, getting this administrative responsibility, uh, failure to meet with the terms of protection uh, order. And very, very few people are prosecuted for, um, uh, according to criminal code. Um, 
during the lo the lockdown, Ministry of Internal uh, Affairs uh, asserted that in May 2020, domestic violence it increased by 65 percent in comparison with the previous year, with the same period. Uh, if we will see the protection order um, issuing, uh, we can see also that it's really a huge number of uh, orders issued from uh, year to year, um, the numbers increasing, but at the same time uh, increasing uh, the numbers um, when the property uh, aggressors not meet uh, with the terms of uh, this order. Also, I would like to say a few words about the um, rapid um, growth uh, in particular years of this issued uh, pro um, protection orders. Uh, in 2007, uh, seven, uh, 2009, we had the um, um, set of angels working, uh, delivering set of trainings uh, to law uh, enforcement bodies. And after this uh, project, um, the numbers of issued orders increased uh, by 10 times. Next jump uh, happened after introduction, uh, new criteria of uh, evaluation of effectiveness of police, uh, police activities, uh, which happened in 2015. So um, also very important um, uh, aspect is the number of female victims uh, of domestic violence. Uh, in this uh, diagram, you can see uh, deaths and injuries um, of women. It is um, an official data. National statistics show small numbers. For example, for 2017, um, officially only two murders were show, uh, um, like, uh, mentioned and four deaths for 2018. A huge difference in statistics and actual cases was recorded by a study conducted by the NGO Women's Democratic Network in Kyrgyzstan in 2018. Um, very interesting issue is media coverage because uh, sometimes um, media reporting uh, cases of death um, uh, of victims of domestic violence and uh, it is sometimes the uh, base for researchers to understand how um, what is the prevalence actually as this type of um, results of domestic violence. Uh, um, regionally, you can see uh, uh, how media coverage on domestic violence in Kyrgyzstan in um, period from uh, 1st January till uh, the 1st October um, um, reported on um, domestic violence uh, or um, better to say wife abuse. So uh, altogether it's 81 cases reported. So, excuse course, me, Gulnara, uh, could you please consider to wrap up in about two minutes, please? Okay, okay, I will try. Um, so, um, actually, um, the majority of discussions um, they defined um, in in discussions the state is being defined as trying to achieve zero domestic violence, and uh, I I'd like to see what exactly was done and how this affected uh, the domestic violence um, decrease. So uh, you can see here, Kyrgyzstan is the first country in the region which accepted the existence of domestic violence in 2003 and developed special legislation. Uh, so we have 17 years um, ago, uh, this unique case of citizens initiative to develop this law. Um, the national gender statistics last 10 years includes the data on domestic violence. 
Uh, two years, uh, for two years now, the practice of state social order has been extended to support the activities of crisis centers. Gender strategy and national election plans on gender equality had as key strategic goal and measures for combating domestic violence. But in reality, we have that this uh, law, uh, 2017, um, appro uh, approved in 2017 law, was the third law on protection from family violence. And even this law was um, um, needed to uh, amendment, uh, which were introduced in April 2019. Uh, and even a government uh, approved urgent action plan to prevent domestic violence in the Kyrgyz Republic. The national statistic doesn't reflect the real prevalence and tendencies of domestic violence. Uh, research done in this uh, sphere, the uh, findings challenge it. The reason develop a set of bylaws to make the laws working. In the list, for example, the state social service, no service of uh, crisis centers is foreseen and no standard operational procedures of service delivery to victims are institutionalized. State doesn't monitor the quality and standardization of services provided in shelters. And never, state never financed uh, um, gender um, achievement, of, um, achieving the gender equality, the, uh, the goals developed in national election plans. And less than 7% of domestic violence cases go to the court. Uh, when a battered wife uses violence against her husband and kill, kills him, she is subject to a harsher court sentence. No one state uh, crisis center was established and no support measures were uh, provided while the only center in north uh, of country was closed during the lockdown. Uh, interesting detail, uh, detail, 65 people were prosecuted for violation of quarantine regime in the country. Uh, of these, only three cases were covered in media and all three cases were perpetrated uh, girls. So, and the last point, uh, where are the money? Uh, because fin uh, fin uh, fi finance for um, combating domestic violence is very important issue. Here I um, uh, try to see what were the resources um, provided uh, by foreign aid uh, assistance uh, during the lockdown. Uh, and uh, it was um, more than um, 400 million USD, but no resources for the pandemic of the violence uh, were foreseen. So, and um, just last um, thing which I would like to say, there is a popular argument of politicians. Let us solve economic issues and then we will finance for gender equality. And uh, here I can uh, show that um, um, approaches to combating terrorism in Kyrgyzstan and combating domestic violence are very uh, different. Uh, we had only 12 people died and 50 uh, people injured as a result of terrorist activities since 2002. And uh, of course, I, I I'm far away from uh, saying only, but if we go compare with the victims of domestic violence, we can see this great difference. Uh, there is special coordinating body along with clearly defined mandates of authorized structures uh, for combating terrorism. And in Kyrgyzstan, we do not have such um, institutional mechanism. And um, we can see the difference in the prosecution of um, criminal um, people. So I would say that uh, based on these um, arguments, I can see that national gender policy and practice is nothing more than rhetoric strategy, the way to play in global games of development. Despite of all the rhetoric efforts, state doesn't consider the domestic violence as a problem which should be in the political agenda.
And de facto, we can see the deeply rooted structural violence, which impact family life and gives impunity in case of violence against uh, wife. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this very important uh, contribution. So then I, I invite the next speaker, Nazgul Min Gisheva, and she will talk about between the past and the future, complexity and diversity of young female consumption in Kazakhstan. Please, the, the floor is yours. Hello. Okay, wait a minute. Um, okay. Can I start, please? Okay, um, I have uh, a lot of data, so <laughs> limited time. So I should be some faster maybe. So, okay. yes, okay. Uh, this, uh, this presentation is a part of my PhD uh, research study. Um, about cultural globalization and pure consumption in Kazakhstan. And I uh, present uh, data on consumption of social network and messengers at popular culture, including cinema, TV shows, and music, and about idols. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, uh, a lot of data. And, most important for me to study structures of consumption, social media and popular culture, and most important uh, to make clear what is about global, regional and local levels. And um, I um, conducted survey uh, from September to March, uh, just uh, before lockdown in Kazakhstan. And um, who participated in my uh, research? Uh, it, it was students of uh, first and second um, courses uh, in Karaganda, uh, because uh, I'm I live here, <laughs> and uh, a limited number of uh, regional researchers in Kazakhstan, and uh, it, it's. Uh, increased uh, my study uh, in maybe uh, four and five times. Uh, uh, in, you can see, uh, I use survey and interviews, more than 400 students uh, in two universities of Karaganda and interviews and for some data about them. Um, yeah, you can see uh, ethnic groups uh, was uh, from 22 ethnicities, and I can say that students didn't like about the ethnicity of nationalities. So uh, I uh, present only uh, 12 and I was uh, with uh, single representatives of different groups. So majority is yes, uh, Kazakhs and uh, what is it called? about geography. Um, I, I was working in the medical uh, university. So majority of students were from this university and uh, uh, we could uh, have students from different regions from Kazakhstan because only four or five medical university in the country. So you can see that um, yes, uh, almost uh, near half of students are from Karaganda and different other from north, south, west and east of Kazakhstan, from uh, three uh, Republican cities uh, North Sultan, Astana, yeah, Almaty, and Shinkin. And uh, four, uh, eight students from uh, four countries. Close, close to Kazakhstan, yes, it's, it's flat. You can see yeah, from Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Mongolia, and yeah, Azerbaijan, and you can see uh, Karaganda. 
uh, in the central Kazakhstan. Um, <clears throat> next. Uh, what is about it to you, demography data? Um, some different structure, uh, 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 increased group of Russians. Uh, it was better <laughs> and more interesting. Uh, so uh, about their geography, again, uh, majority from Karaganda Oblast and Karaganda City and um, mixing from uh, mostly North and uh, South Oblast. Uh, southern Oblast and from Alate and Shimkent and Mushikan. So, okay, I will start and I I should be more brief because a uh, lot of data and uh, very briefly. So, um, um, what is about uh, uh, social networks and messengers? Um, we can see that, yes, competition between VK and Instagram. And I can say that Instagram is the most uh, growing social network among young people in Kazakhstan. And about messengers, uh, yes, what's, WhatsApp is highly popul uh, popular and in uh, interesting times, popularity of Telegram is also increasing significantly increasing, uh, especially uh, here uh, among females, interview showed some different proportion. So uh, what is about um, social networks uh, uh, by interview? Ah, yes, yes, I'm sorry. Again, you can see some, uh, it's combinations between messengers and uh, social networks. And again, Instagram is more popular. And it's very interesting that uh, two new uh, social networks. First of all, it's image boards, yeah? It's uh, anonymous uh, networks. It was new for me. And YouTube, mostly by young women. So, okay. What is the main aims of female consumption? I need to focus mostly on female consumption. So, um, yeah, some limited data, uh, selected data here. So you can see different, but if we count, yes, we can see that communication and use more prevail to compare with education information entertainment. And why Instagram is more popular uh, among females uh, from surveys and interviews? Yeah. Because it's the most diverse, more visual and more freedom, um, less uh, censorship. And YouTube gives opportunities to study and recreation, self-development and so on. And most interesting about new influencers. I will uh, talk about this in the end of this presentation. It's very interesting data because it's some changing a lot. <laughs> so uh, about popular culture, data from survey and um, interviews, um, some similar, some different. And we can see that uh, Western movies, uh, yeah, more popular, but in the same time, uh, Asian f uh, movies um, yeah, mostly consumed by young women. So, and it's interesting about African titles and so on. Um, about uh, from interview again. Uh, Western movies more popular, but uh, maybe females more more patriotic. <laughs> they talk uh, more about Kazakh uh, movies, mostly about comedies, sitcoms, uh, and so on. Okay, uh, what is about serials? 
Um, yes, uh, females, uh, young females are more active to compare with uh, male peers uh, to consult uh, uh, soap operas. And again, uh, American and Russian more popular. But in the same time, they mentioned also about color. And uh, the most interesting, the exact data on Turkish and Korean, very com competitive. Uh, again, it, it will be again in the interviews. So, um, in interview, yeah, uh, both males and females mostly uh, talked about Western type of names. At the same time, so Asian, uh, yeah, many times watched by young women and music. Uh, music present competitive uh, discourses between Western, Russian and Kazakh in recent times, uh, especially on Kazakh uh, popular culture, Kupo. Um, <clears throat> and uh, again, Asian music, uh, mostly mentioned by BTS, popular uh, band uh, of Korea, uh, from South Korea. So, and many times, more than 70 times, 70 times watching by, uh, listened by young women and music uh, from interview. Again, Western most uh, listen, but again, uh, Asian, Kazakh uh, artists, and more interestingly, classical music. Um, more, maybe it's about cultural protocol uh, among females. So some conclusions uh, about popular culture. Yes, uh, we can see domination of Western uh, movies uh, among, among both students, males and females, uh, but women demonstrated more diverse consumption, enriched by Korean, African, and Kazakh movies. Um, about uh, serials, um, uh, in interviews, um, young women uh, told most again some competition between Turkish and Korean, including Chinese uh, uh, fantasies. Uh, and only one man, young man, talked about Turkish soap opera. Uh, and music, music, yes, um, it's about um, equality. Um, consumption between Western and translocal uh, music. Uh, and uh, in the same times, uh, in interviews, um, females uh, uh, demonstrated complicated consumption with K-pop, K-pop, uh, and we can see in idols. This yes, idols, um, it was surprised for me uh, because it's, very different that it was five or ten years ago because uh, what is about uh, gender of idols um, yeah uh, among young women males um, idols increased a lot uh, maybe ten five years ago uh, females uh, talked or wrote about mostly Women's, but some, uh, some maybe I don't know how, <laughs> how it can be taught. Uh, maybe some empowerment, uh, emancipation. <laughs> so, uh, geography, yeah, again, uh, Western um, may be a person's more popular, but in the same time, females demonstrated complicated between um, complicated competition between Western and Kazakh uh, persons. Uh, interestingly, that Soviet also uh, persons were mentioned. Yeah. And from interview, um, 
again, uh, here uh, most uh, uh, females talk about um, their families. Okay, I have two minutes left. <laughs> yeah, I have. Uh, I think yes, I have three slides. So, okay. I, yes, I think I I will be in time. So, um, yeah, it's very interesting uh, because I can say about um, significant transformation about idols of favorite person because several years ago, uh, him, uh, young woman mostly talked about actresses and models. In this interview, I think that in survey they wrote about models, but here no one models, mostly about uh, artists, but not about their professional work, about uh, their charity and, uh, uh, and uh, social activity, civic activity, <laughs> feminism, and so on. And uh, what is about men? Uh, men who can change uh, their life, who can influence and so on. And interestingly, yes, the three women talked about BTS, inspired by this group, by, by this band. And uh, one uh, girl mentioned about women from Pakistan. She didn't remember her name. I Googled and uh, my guess it, it's about Muhtaramai uh, from Pakistan. And from Russia, two men, but they are influencers. Um, so some conclusions. Um, it's interesting that uh, now uh, young women uh, not sick on the beauty, <laughs> uh, but they talked about beauty, but uh, mostly about uh, motivation and civic activity of uh, famous persons. And their position between families and strong women and young um, Is it possible to talk about empowerment of young women? And my general conclusions, yes, new media and social networks uh, present more freedom and creativity for young generation in Kazakhstan. And Instagram, YouTube develop and motivate, motivate uh, young people and uh, uh, social networks and telegram, especially image boards, uh, use some alternative information, more secure uh, anonymous communication, more opportunities uh, in this uh, sphere. And uh, in the same times, I can say during interviews, they demonstrated conscious and very critical consumption of media and popular culture, especially about um, Russian and Kazakh movies to compare with Western. So they consult uh, mostly, they prefer uh, Western uh, products. Um, in the same time, they are very close to their family. They talk a lot about it. And yes, young women presented complex and diverse consumption, maybe some emancipation and uh, most important about conjunction of cultural and social capital. Okay, uh, yeah, I finish. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. This was really important and interesting and unique research, I think. Yes, it's uh, empowerment from consumption. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so then we go on to the last presentation and so I invite Janar Emir Bjekova and Sirik Bey Sembayev. Yes. And they will talk about new wave of feminist activism in Kazakhstan. Please welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, I'm very happy to be here today. So uh, uh, if you will allow, I will open my presentations. And does it seem? Is it okay? Yes, that's great. Yes. Okay, thank you. Give me just a moment. And yes, uh, today uh, we uh, want to share with you uh, our uh, 
findings uh, from our uh, uh, works. Actually, uh, this uh, today's presentation is the part of uh, bigger works which uh, named as gender equality issues in Kazakhstan. Uh, so we uh, studying the women's in the economic, political and social cultural spheres with our uh, colleagues and uh, uh, trying to uh, analyze uh, the development strategies of Kazakhstan and state that uh, aimed uh, the creating of a welfare state and uh, especially uh, our uh, focus was uh, on the uh, gender issues of uh, such uh, state programs and uh, how these uh, implementations of gender policy equality uh, was reflected in uh, all spheres of state and community life. Uh, so uh, uh, when we are uh, talking about the um, uh, development of uh, women organizations uh, in sovereign Kazakhstan, uh, so uh, they are uh, of course largely uh, determined by specific uh, historical conditions and circumstances, uh, as well as the internal political situations at a certain stage. Uh, and priorities of state policy uh, in the social, economic, and social political spheres. So, uh, for these uh, reasons, uh, we uh, divided uh, this uh, women movement uh, in uh, three uh, uh, etapes, in three stages, and uh, this uh, analytical review. Uh, and material from open source, they are uh, possible uh, make this uh, chronology, which you are seeing now at the, uh, your uh, ecrans. And uh, we think that uh, optimum periodizations is to uh, divide uh, they, uh, into three, uh, three mainly uh, case stages, uh, and which also reflect the three deca uh, decades of independent Kazakhstan. So uh, first was is establishment of women movements in just uh, in Kazakhstan at the early stage. Then uh, we can uh, say the instantanizations of this women movement and uh, gender uh, policy uh, shaping by the uh, state and uh, uh, also uh, and today discussions will uh, talking about the new wave of women organizations which uh, occurring and become uh, more active since uh, 2010. And uh, when we are talking about the uh, period of the last decade, uh, it has been uh, characterized by these three uh, key trends. Uh, first of all, the expansion of the position of women in the business environment, uh, the institutional strengthening of women's organizations at the uh, level of international corporations, and uh, the emergence of the new wave feminists. Uh, so, uh, these uh, mainly uh, three uh, key trends was important. Uh, and uh, uh, also, it should be noted that uh, formations uh, of the field of women organizations in quantitative and qualitative terms are uh, associated to the general processes of stabilizations of the number of uh, actual operating NGOs in countries. And at the same time, uh, the statistical data, uh, here we are giving the data from the uh, uh, 2018, so they stated that uh, almost uh, 15,000 uh, NGOs operated and uh, 500 of them uh, uh, were stable and leaded by women, and uh, among these NGOs, uh, 77 uh, uh, is focused on the uh, family and gender issue. And uh, uh, at the same time, uh, these uh, NGOs closely cooperate with many uh, large uh, international organizations uh, like uh, United Nations uh, Women's Structures, 
OI, uh, SC financial and financial institutions like ABRD and uh, Asian Development Bank. So cooperation with uh, organizations uh, dealing with gender uh, education and the economic advancement of women is also actively developing and such as uh, Global Women's Summit, World Islamic Economic Forums and uh, World Forums of Women Entrepreneurs uh, as well as uh, Eurasian Women's Forums and Films Union, Russia, and etc. Uh, we can see this uh, uh, active uh, uh, activity. And also in this direction, uh, direction, the process of supporting women entrepreneurs uh, are developing in very quantitative and novel uh, uh, way. And we can uh, talking about the uh, new level for supporting the women entrepreneurs. And of course, uh, here we should uh, uh, talking about the support from the EBRD mentoring programs for uh, uh, which is launched in uh, 2017s and gives a good opportunity for aspiring women businessmen to work with attached mentors on individuals uh, tasked to build their own business. Uh, also, uh, the, we can see the uh, very active positions of the NPP Atamekan, uh, which is uh, our main state uh, body for supporting entrepreneurships. And we see two important uh, activity here, the creating the uh, Council of Business Women in 2015, as well as the Foundation for Supporting Women Entrepreneurship. Uh, also, uh, uh, by the uh, supporting of uh, four big organizations, uh, there has become the, uh, some activity in the rural area, and we are uh, was uh, seeing the first forum of rural women, which is also uh, very important in the case of uh, empowering uh, women in Kazakhstan. Uh, so, and also I want to uh, make remark on the Alliance of Women Forces of Kazakhstan, uh, which includes uh, 20 NGOs and organizations uh, that address uh, uh, different issues uh, related to gender uh, uh, problems uh, in Kazakhstan, uh, like the violation of the rights of women and children, gender inequality, and the creations of opportunity for the advancement of women in the political, economic, and social uh, activities. So uh, this uh, Alliance of Women Forces of Kazakhstan, uh, they are uh, plans uh, to lobby for the uh, different, uh, they have a, a very interesting um, agenda uh, as uh, adoptions of a law on sexual harassment and tortures accountability for crimes related to domestic violence, uh, as well as uh, they promoting women's uh, to uh, become uh, decision makers and uh, uh, also uh, advocate for the 30 persons in the executive and state power structures should be given to women, uh, promoting uh, women also on the party list uh, on equal terms with men. And uh, also uh, they are uh, advocates for the uh, white quotas uh, or positive uh, discriminations of women. So uh, among these, uh, we also uh, can tell us about the uh, growth of uh, feminist activism in the last decades. And uh, here uh, we are trying to uh, underline the uh, uh, most uh, known uh, activities and uh, so uh, <clears throat> one of the uh, brightest uh, cases of this uh, new wave of feminism and femme activism uh, in the uh, as the public organizations i want to mention the femagora which grew up uh, on the uh, initiatives to hold the festival at the same names two, two years ago and this uh, festivals from them is held annually and highlight the uh, activism of women and the gender situations uh, as well to uh, solidity feminist initiatives so the uh, point is that this uh, organizations uh, bring together uh, um, activists and uh, uh, women uh, in different uh, spheres 
uh, from uh, all Central Asia. Uh, so uh, if you will uh, have visited their uh, uh, <clears throat> site, you can see a very uh, uh, different, uh, very interesting uh, discussions uh, related to politics, related to economy, uh, medicine and other issue which is faced uh, women uh, in this year and in the previous years. And also uh, another uh, important uh, organizations uh, which issues the sexual violence against women uh, and uh, very actively raised uh, by the uh, Don't Be Silent Foundations, uh, which organizations was created uh, on the uh, basis of this movement with the same names by Dina Smailova. And, uh, uh, one uh, of the main tasks of this foundation is to bring to the problems of violence in the public space and fights against victim blaming in society. And thanks to the work of this fund and other organizations, uh, we have a, a very a serious legislative changes were adopted in 2020 in this year and according to which rapes was transformed to the composition of serious crimes and the sentences for rapists were increasing and it was really a, a big uh, uh, um, issue for this year uh, among this uh, preventive activ activism. Uh, and uh, uh, so, uh, also uh, what should be uh, saying that uh, uh, move, uh, movement, civic movements uh, are associated simultaneously with the third wave of feminisms and uh, uh, LGBT movements. So the Kazakhstan Feminist Initiative Feminita uh, actively promotes uh, human rights initiatives and uh, in uh, current year, the organizations come forward with demands to abolish the list of prohibited professions for women. And uh, uh, Femme Point is focused on supporting uh, lesbian, including gay marriage advocacy. Uh, and another uh, important organizations is the CASFEM, which is, uh, has uh, uh, more radical left and anarcho-feminist orientations and differs from other organizations in that only women can take part in its activities. So uh, unlike traditional feminist organizations, these initiative groups are uh, informal associations and often hold public events to attract uh, people's attentions. So uh, uh, from the 2017 on March 8, the CASFEM members for the first time held the street actions the Women's March in Almaty, uh, which was banned by the authorities in 2018. But in general, the projects of new Kazakhstani feminists should be uh, considered as constructive, although elements of creativity and often perceived by the public and uh, law enforcement agency as uh, provocatory acts. But uh, uh, in the summary, uh, I want to say that uh, this uh, dynamic process of promoting the values of gender equality and feminism in Kazakhstani society and the actualizations of the problems of protecting the rights of women was accompanied by a phase of institutional development. And it is thanks uh, to the activity of women's organizations that significantly and consistent progress is achieved in these directions including the improvement of legislations, increasing degree of information, popularizations, and the practical implementations of socially significant projects focuses on these uh, concrete results. And uh, also, I want to uh, uh, share some photos from these uh, uh, Femagora festivals, and maybe, uh, and also want to invite all of you uh, as uh, for, uh, to attain for the next years uh, to uh, our uh, festivals. So thank you very much and thank you very much for uh, organizing these uh, events. Thank you very much. This was really very interesting as well and sort of giving a slightly different um, point of view from some of the other presentations. So Thank you very much. Now I will ask Nathan to give his comments, please. And then meanwhile, I would like the, the uh, 
participants in the conference to kindly either write, uh, write some questions or, or something you would like to highlight in the chat. And you can also raise hands. So I would prefer if you could uh, uh, give your voice by yourself. But anyway, to, to as we are so many, it would be nice to, to see that you have a question in the chat so I don't miss it. OK, thank you. So please, Nathan. Yes, hello. Uh, can everybody hear me? I guess I can hear myself back, so you must be able to hear me. Um, yes, we can hear you. Great. Uh, OK, let me see the gallery. OK, I, I, I just wanted to start by pointing out that I think it's amazing. We have 82 participants now. Uh, I think it's very good. Uh, everybody should be very proud that this is such a well attended event. And it's very nice to see so many people from all over. I don't know if we get much beyond Europe and, and uh, Central Asia, but I, I see names that I know from many parts of Europe anyway. Um, yeah, thank you very much. I think these are all very interesting and very diverse presentations. Um, I would just like to start, uh, I, I'm not gonna comment very uh, much in detail, just bring up a few things that I think might be uh, central for uh, each one. Um, I, I also won't try to bring them together because I think they're very diverse, uh, very interesting, um, different perspectives. So the first one for Galim Jusupek and Jana Nagayeva. Um, I, I think this is an incredibly rich uh, theoretical path to take uh, and, and uh, I'm not an expert on neoliberal theories of neoliberalism or, or uh, research on it, but I think that the uh, intersection of the neoliberal economy and politics and retraditionalization is, is uh, very rich. And I look forward to seeing this developed uh, more strongly. Um, I think the most important will just be to, to define your terms. Um, I, I'll just focus my questions or comments on retraditionalization re because it's um, something that I could say a little more about. Um, I think that the most important things to point out about it are that it is extremely varied. And in fact, much of what is supposedly a return to tradition is a novel uh, invention. And so it's very difficult to um, we can use the term re-traditionalization as a general concept, but it's, it's, um, it describes many different things. And I think that has to be teased apart uh, very carefully. Um, I like the way you bring up the question of authenticity. I think that needs to be theorized uh, better and, or defined better to show how it works. I think in all these cases, um, for all these terms, you need more specific examples. Uh, I think the, the uh, example of, of um, the weddings is very interesting. Um, and, and that could be developed more, but also compared to other aspects of uh, what is sort of a, you, you're calling it a, a mixture of the ethnic tradition and the modern or the, the neo uh, neoliberal capitalist movement. But it, it might be, more useful to just look at the many different ways that the sort of ethnic traditions find expression in, in many different uh, technologies, as well as these, these uh, capitalist economic formations. So um, I, I, I think I'll stop there, but just point out that, that I think uh, many things about economic activity, religion, and, um, and this idea of tradition have to be uh, teased apart because there's many different ways of approaching religion and there's many uh, different concepts of, of uh, uh, tradition and, and the, the, the use of the market. So I can think of uh, sort of very different figures who show up in, in uh, sort of market contexts, whether they're religious, traditional, uh, supposedly traditional or re-traditional religious figures or if they're, if they're uh, uh, less religious but still uh, incorporate religious ideas and so on. So the examples would help uh, pull out this, ethnographic examples of, 
of uh, where people uh, fall into these uh, on a spectrum uh, on the, of the many different uh, poles that you present here. Um, so for Gulnara Ibrahim, I, I, I think this is a very fascinating uh, paper. You have a very strong argument at the end. I think it's very useful um, to bring up the question of where is the funding? Uh, why is there so little attention paid to domestic abuse? Um, and I wonder if you can't uh, develop that a little more through the paper um, by comparing, perhaps. So uh, you could compare, right at the beginning, you could mention the number of injuries and deaths due to terrorism versus that uh, due to domestic violence, just to, to set the tone for this kind of uh, question at the end. Um, and the same thing, I, I thought it would have been useful to have more data about other kinds of violence and, and um, both, both the statistics about the uh, occurrences, but also the, the uh, kinds of prosecutions. Um, because I think there's one uh, big issue here, which I haven't seen treated well in the literature, which is about um, in Kyrgyzstan, the police really emphasize reconciliation, which we've seen has can have extremely horrible effects, including death. Um, so it might be mentioned where this comes from, why there's an orientation towards reconciliation and how that might play into these statistics of very low prosecution. Um, you know, is it is it just inconvenient to prosecute? Are they trying to keep statistics down, or are they just uh, so oriented towards reconciliation that they try to um, avoid uh, other alternatives such as prosecution? Um, and and that might be something you could fit into the question of structural violence. Uh, if the police have a structural approach to violence then that sort of aggravates and, and reiterates the, the conditions that create more violence. Okay, um, so thank you very much for that. I think it's very rich material. Um, for the next one, uh, sorry, I have to roll down my notes here. Okay, Nazgul Mengishiba, thank you very much. Excellent and very interesting uh, research on uh, the various kinds of media consumption, online consumption, uh, music, arts, um, and, and sort of the ideas behind it, the interviews, the, using interviews to tease out uh, motivations and so on for, for the different kind of uh, um, media consumption. And, and particularly interesting is this idea of anonymity and, and different kinds of uh, self-presentation online. Um, and uh, as well as the shift towards uh, sort of more um, activist or uh, ideals, uh, figures who stand for more activism. Um, I, I think that the, the, the biggest, uh, you know, sort of benefit and advantage of this is that you can pull out a lot of these kinds of correlations between gender, uh, ethnicity and kinds of consumption. Um, I, I don't have a lot of uh, issues to add to this, um, but I think that uh, in particular, um, there, there's sort of a category problem that shows up in a few of these places. Um, for instance, the soap operas versus uh, TV, television. I think there was a, yeah, there's a, there's a cinema and cartoons you categorize as Asian, but then at some point, you have things like Turkish, Korean, Chinese, Mexican, so different different categories. So it would be interesting to know if, and yeah, Western and Asian. So which of these um, uh, Turkish, uh, for instance, or Mexican, uh, or um, the, the other uh, ones would be Brazil, uh, as far as I know, the Brazilian and maybe Moroccan soap operas, I think would be interesting too. Specify. And then when you get to Asia, it, it, it's worthwhile to think about uh, Indian films since they were already uh, very important in the Soviet period. Um, so that might be another category, which perhaps now is 
not interesting, but the older Indian films would be interesting. Um, so I, I don't really have a good uh, theoretical model <laughs> to talk about here, but I think certainly the data about uh, chronological change is very interesting. Um, and then for the last uh, presentation, thank you very much, Janar Temir Bekova. Um, I, I, I think this is very interesting information. Uh, the, the new wave of feminism uh, and feminist activisms, which I think is a very uh, good term to use, is, is extremely exciting um, to read about. Uh, perhaps I would, I would just say uh, you need to maybe suggest a little bit more about connections to um, Russia other uh, Central Asian countries um, and and how these how these connections you know you mentioned summits and various organizations but how do these connections work what kind of what kind of dynamism is there um, who's inspiring whom uh, who and and you know what what are the sort of figures you know not just these organizations but who are the figures who stand out as as sort of having accomplished things and, and pushed uh, the limits or, or created new ways of seeing things like were and, and were there particular events that, that uh, promoted this. So, so I think this is a very good uh, framework, but, but maybe um, you could produce a little more uh, detail in terms of um, how people uh, interact with these and, and how they see them as, as emerging uh, through events and individuals, um, as well as obviously collective actions, um, and then their connections internationally to whatever extent there might be. Um, so I, I think that's all my comments. Uh, thank you, and, and I look forward to hearing everybody else's comments. Okay, I will let each of you respond, but I will just add one question from Julia Gratskova, who wanted to pose this question herself. And then after that, I will go to the, to the chat and take these questions. Um, so that will be another, uh, another round. So please, Julia, go ahead with your question now. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank all the participants because this was an extremely interesting and I wanted to thank uh, in particular Galim Yusebek because he was so important person in setting up the whole panel and the whole discussion. So I'm very grateful. And my question is to Galim also because your paper was so theoretical and um, you said that um, retraditionalization legitimizes uh, authoritarian uh, authoritarian regimes and um, what I am interested in uh, I mean I understand it very well that it legitimizes uh, authoritarian regimes but as uh, the discussions we have when we are discussing situation with retraditionalization uh, turn in Russia or in Hungary uh, is always who else what social groups what parts of the society still are benefiting from this retraditionalization Usually it is very difficult question to answer with respect to Russia or Hungary, if I, I remember well from different conferences. So uh, my question is maybe you have some good answer for Kazakhstan. So who else apart from the, those in power, the authoritarian power, who else is benefiting? For whom it is uh, um, um, good to... Um, uh, use these concepts, what, what social groups, uh, probably, if you can tell. Um, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Julia. Now I give the word to each presenter in, in the turn of your presentation to maybe be able to say something, answer to Naita's questions or Julia's question. So please go ahead then, Galim, first. Two minutes. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah, Dr. Nathan, thank you very much for your comments. Uh, yeah, we uh, will try new concept, maybe um, uh, invention of tradition. Yeah, we somehow missed this concept because the retraditionalization may not be uh, fully explain the situation, the ongoing processes. Yeah, thank you very much. And, I took notes and uh, uh, will 
study your your comments. Uh, thank you very much for for your feedback. Yeah, concerning the question of uh, Yulia, I think um, um, many groups uh, benefit can benefit from re-traditionalization. Uh, may may be very uh, strange for for all of us, but a part of our intelligentsia some of our intellectuals, some of our native academicians, they are very much enthusiastic about re-traditionalization because uh, particularly the um, scholars in, uh, in the field of uh, Kazakh literature, Kazakh language, history, uh, uh, in short, in the, those who are in arts and humanities are very much enthusiastic about re-traditionalization. Uh, another group, uh, journalists, uh, particularly those who uh, who are very who are who are, pre who are preoccupied with the position of Kazakh language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, please don't misunderstand me. I'm not a I'm not against Kazakh language. Um, I am very much. Uh, I'm 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 um, strongly supporting this uh, phenomenon development of native language, but it it shouldn't be at the expense of the rights of other people. Uh, another group, I think. Uh, it's um, people uh, who misperceive um, the concept nation with ethnicity. And uh, we have a lot of these people. Um, they uh, misconceptualize, they, they just misunderstand that ethnicity doesn't equal nation. And I think these people may perceive the development of traditions or the progress of re-traditionalization as a development of a nation, as a development of Kazakhstan. And uh, yeah, in short, many groups maybe can, can benefit from re-traditionalization. Also religious clergy or clergy, religious uh, bureaucracy, so-called, uh, organized around muftiats. Um, yeah, in short, my answer is this, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Then we we go to Gulnara. Two minutes for you. Thank you so much, uh, Nathan, uh, for valuable comments. And uh, it is the way I also thought in terms of comparison of different types of uh, um, violence uh, against women. And uh, first of all, uh, very famous for, uh, like, set famous, let's say, for our region, it's Alakachu, bright kidnapping. And I also um, thought uh, about this and uh, have seen that uh, annually numbers are 33 cases per year starting from 2013 uh, despite we all know that every uh, um, according to uh, UN Women research every fifth um, marriage is based on bright kidnapping so and um, when you say about reconciliation uh, concept it's also very interesting uh, first of all I thought that I will not focus on in this particular um, paper on the global level and how actually global um, processes uh, and global structural violence can affect uh, the national one but um, in terms of reconciliation I thought about uh, new um, uh, changes with legislation in terms of humanization. And in 2019, when um, this humanization was introduced, for example, uh, the Institute of Probation was introduced uh, among different other mechanisms. And already this year, it was the first precedence of humanizations of the person who kidnapped the uh, 16 years uh, old girl and the, this guy was, sent, was sentenced by the court to probation supervision for one year. Well, uh, it is exactly this wonderful connection <laughs> with <laughs> like who actually invented this <laughs> kind of reconciliation. Yeah, it's, thank you. I will think about this and I hope that my arguments uh, will be strong enough in order to show to our government that uh, we already 
how to say, full of this rhetoric approach and we need real um, measures. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you very much. Gunara, then I give the word to Nazgul for two minutes, mm, yeah. please. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, uh, okay, I will start maybe with gender ethnicity language. Uh, I may make, I did uh, some correlations between language. Uh, and I can say that our uh, students um, who study in Kazakh, Russian, or English, or uh, follow their language uh, uh, of study, maybe uh, some, maybe some differences. Uh, I, I don't remember exactly now. But about ethnicity, um, it was interesting that um, a Russian young woman also told uh, about uh, Korean dramas, um, Korean um, soap operas, uh, and uh, it doesn't matter color for Russian uh, girls. They mentioned about lightness and mildness of um, K-pop and inspiring from it. It's so, so, um, and Indian. Um, I remember one mention about Indian movies, uh, but it was not uh, uh, related to Soviet <laughs> or some maybe uh, Romantic movies uh, from India. Uh, it's about mostly about modern Indian movies like uh, My Name is Alf. Uh, um, uh, I forgot the title of the movie. Um, it's it's new generation of Indian cinematograph, maybe uh, and, uh, not belonging to Soviet. Uh, um, to times of their parents. Um, and about theory, yes, um, I I plan, of course, to apply for my PhD thesis. Um, and um, um, I, I didn't have time to, uh, to include the theoretical part, but uh, I'm interested in, um, in works of, uh, Marvin Craigie, maybe it's about hybridity in cultural globalization, uh, about the um, construction of um, maybe post colonial hybridity through media, influence of media. But I didn't study um, enough. <laughs> um, I, I'm still working with data. Um, I need to finish and uh, go to theory. So it, it, it's my place. Thank you. And maybe. Thank you, that's great. Okay. Thank you very much, Nazgul. And then we go to the fourth presentation. Janar, please. Uh, yes, thank you very much again. And uh, uh, I think that uh, what is uh, important uh, from uh, our um, collaborations is to um, uh, change uh, our ideas and uh, maybe uh, some uh, useful uh, instruments for uh, attaching uh, uh, attention for uh, these uh, important issues. And uh, what we are uh, find that it's a better work when the uh, when the uh, uh, activists and uh, scientists are collaborate together, because uh, sometimes uh, uh, we scientists uh, uh, have a, um, lower uh, portion of patients. But sometimes uh, activists, uh, they are uh, need for this, uh, some different uh, supports with uh, other countries' uh, findings and maybe uh, 
much more related issue will give them uh, better understanding of uh, local problems. And in that way, um, I believe that uh, this uh, uh, women rights and empowerment of women, uh, they, uh, all of us are responsible for these issues and we uh, can uh, make our contributions in uh, every point of our lives and uh, in every point of our activities uh, by promoting this issue, by uh, uh, paying attention to its importance and uh, for uh, creating new uh, resource. So thank you very much for your events. And uh, I hope this is will not our uh, last meetings and uh, we will be very happy to see you in Kazakhstan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, that, then we will go to some of the other questions here and you will all get some time for comments. Also, Nathan will get some extra time. So uh, there are really many questions here and I will try to uh, do it quickly here because we, we can't go through everything. But you can also read yourself here, I think. But I was I was um, I wanted to to emphasize that there, there are questions about these women's movements and women's rights in, in Central Asia during the Soviet time. Then there is also a question uh, about difference between old and new wave of feminism in Kazakhstan if Jana could say something about that. And we also, um, there is a question, well, actually to both Galim and, and, and uh, Janara about women's role in this re-traditionalization movement and how Kazakh people within and outside of these movements see feminist organization. Do they see them as opposite to re-traditionalization and part of Western movement? Or is there space within the construction of traditional roles for these movements? And I will also add one question for myself in this perspective. Uh, would you consider uh, Soviet practices to be sort of still influencing uh, how do they relate to these sort of uh, waves of re-traditionalization that you have been talking about? And is there a question also of generation? What about the young women? Do they adhere to, well, Western values more, do you think? Or, or do they also follow, for example, Russian feminists? I can see a connection, for example, if you look at women feminists in Russia, there are also these femi feminine sort of festivals. And you can also see there that there is a lot of activity on social media in different ways. So is there any connection, for example, between Kazakh women and, and women feminists and, and Russian young feminists? So if these were a few different questions, so you, you get a couple of minutes each again, and then we'll try to, to make another short round after that. So please, Galim, if you could uh, start again, and we go through the same order. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your question. Uh, in general, I think uh, that uh, different types or uh, different methods uh, sh must be tried to develop women's rights. Um, if you take specifically the concept of feminism, uh, according to my opinion, this concept uh, may not sound so good with a majority of people in Kazakhstan, yeah, particularly with, with males. Uh, this concept uh, has generally negative connotations. And uh, I think um, we need uh, different concepts, maybe additional concepts uh, to develop women's rights. Uh, I think we shouldn't stick to one concept. Even um, 
yeah, it's uh, my own personal experience also because uh, I have a close connection with students. Uh, I am teaching the course Human Rights. Uh, it, it is 10th semester, 11th semester. Uh, it's very important to develop um, woman, women's rights friendly uh, interpretations from, uh, from Central Asian culture, even women's, women's uh, rights friendly religious interpretations. Uh, as far as I know, there is powerful emerging trend in, uh, in, in the Western countries called Islamic feminism. I think it may be very empowering for a re religious women in Central Asia because some of them are very, um, very, very cautious about the Western concepts, but they are suffering from the violation of their rights and they, in, they are in deadlock. They cannot uh, fully use Western originated concepts, so-called Western originated and feminism stands like this, but at the same time, they cannot continue with this life. Uh, they are under subjugation. And uh, the concepts, the notions like Islamic feminism or uh, gender egalitarian Islamic interpretations may help them. And why not to develop them in Central Asia? Why not to develop gender egalitarian uh, understandings of being Kazakh, being Uzbek? Because culture isn't something static, isn't something monolithic, it's a dynamic. It's, yeah. In, in short, my answer is this, yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. So, Gulnara, please. Yes, uh, despite you didn't uh, directly ask me in, 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 um, um, in relation with my paper, I would like to add to the question uh, uh, you addressed to Galim, actually uh, based on Kyrgyz uh, current uh, is, um, situation. Um, we have now, from my perspective, very strong clash between uh, so-called feminist or gender activists um, and um, women groups which are considered themselves as traditional. Uh, it was a um, great um, conflict, let's say, uh, on the uh, 8th of March when a um, group of women uh, together with, uh, combined with very aggressive groups of men uh, comes to uh, feminist groups uh, who was going, who were going to um, have this uh, peaceful march uh, for the women's right. And these women, they pronounce very interesting motto. They said, uh, nation is uh, much more higher than human rights nation's rights are much more uh, higher and uh, dominant than human rights. And um, speaking about uh, actually new wave, old wave, I could say that in Kyrgyzstan, um, we have very um, big uh, fragmentation within women movement, for example, uh, within uh, other parts of uh, civil society and we have all mixed uh, there uh, people who are trying to uh, set um, uh, as dominant human rights uh, as it's written in uh, different international conventions or uh, as Galim trying segregate women's rights into the very specific, um, probably um, separate uh, into a very specific um, set of rights. And uh, we have uh, even conflict and uh, misunderstandings be, uh, in communication between so-called old and new uh, feminists. Um, I personally sometimes um, spending 30 years in civil society in women's groups, I personally cannot understand sometimes people uh, who belongs to young uh, feminist or uh, LGBT um, groups. We cannot speak the same language because it seems that uh, some um, very marginalized uh, groups, they elaborated 
special language which I do not possess and any um, uh, um, any time I approach to communicate to them, uh, I um, go beyond the borders they consider as ethical borders. And as for um, um, like impact of Soviet traditions, it's a Soviet tradition, of course, uh, as Nathan said, it's very uh, this, um, how to say. Uh, the, the definition which <laughs> is very doubtful, uh, what is uh, actually Soviet tradition, but um, conducting any research uh, in, any par in, in different spheres, I always discover some um, Soviet approach, let's say, uh, in, in very vernaculars of the relations. In, in very uh, tiny, very hidden places. For example, uh, now we are conducting research on um, uh, 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 attitudes toward ch children with disabilities. And uh, we face that providers of services, they are supporting old, um, as they say, Soviet tradition to uh, institutionalized from very birth, uh, uh, children with uh, some obvious, as they say, uh, types of disability. So, and when you uh, ask why actually home is not better for them, they say, uh, they, 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 um, like the arguments are related to wonderful evidence which brings uh, Soviet education and uh, socialization within special places for such kin uh, children. So, but in in general, you cannot say that Soviet tradition is still affecting. There are very, very like deeply rooted things from my perspective. Okay, thank you very much, Gunara. Okay, Nazgul, please. Um, for my research about um, uh, my special, uh, yeah, uh, it's mostly about uh, yes, uh, discourses of um, either famous persons. Um, I told yes, it's it's um, a, a significant transformation in um, perception of um, celebrities. <laughs> And concentration on, on the um, civic activity um, and uh, women who defend uh, human rights and human rights uh, worldwide. Um, so I, I think it's some maybe conscious transformations um, when young people not interested only in entertainment but uh, in some social problems, um, issues, and they are inspired by uh, strong uh, women and men <laughs> who can uh, resolve problems and um, the most interested when they are inspired by uh, maybe powerful uh, characters, female characters like uh, Christina Young <laughs> from Grace Anatomy. And, uh, they can be such some model of um, strong women. So, it's from my research perspective, <laughs> some conclusions. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Then, uh, Jana, please. Yes, thank you. Uh, Actually, uh, I think that uh, in that discourse uh, about the uh, old and new feminism groups, uh, I prefer to uh, talking about uh, inclusion, uh, inclusion in all aspects. So, and uh, mainly concentrate uh, on uh, our uh, similarities rather than differences, because. Uh, uh, especially in the Central Asian countries, there is uh, not uh, so many feminist initiatives. And uh, I think we should uh, think more uh, about solidarity between them rather than uh, talking about 
uh, misunderstanding between uh, generations, as Gulnara mentioned. And of course, uh, every group will have their own set of values and maybe different perceptions on different issues. But still, uh, they are uh, wondering about uh, women's rights. And this is, uh, I think, the most important issue. And uh, unfortunately, uh, despite the uh, very uh, important reform during the Soviet period, uh, and uh, we still have a lot of problems related to uh, women's rights. And uh, as mentioned, Ravalum uh, and uh, Gunara, the uh, rising the uh, uh, mainly the uh, uh, tra uh, traditional values become uh, uh, more important. Uh, and this is maybe also uh, another issue and should be analyzed in the point of uh, after um, uh, post-imperial syndrome. It's also maybe an uh, important point uh, for uh, uh, research. But uh, now uh, I think that mainly we should we uh, should uh, think and acting uh, in the frame of inclusive values and trying to understand and trying to uh, making uh, more, uh, find more uh, common point. Thank you very much. Okay, I give the word to Nathan. I see that we are actually, we, we have to wrap up. Unfortunately, there are still so many questions, but Nathan, is there anything you would like to add or? Uh, no, I was hoping we could have a discussion since we have so many people participating. Oh. But okay, uh, unfortunately, let's, let's continue a little bit then. If 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 it's okay, we'll just continue for another few minutes. Okay. Uh, yes. Just I, I will just uh, um, try to to. Um, there are a few questions. I, I, I will ask them quickly here. There is one question about the, the importance of the Istanbul Convention. If, if you could say comment if this is important for you, for your countries. Uh, and what about international human rights tools? Well, I mean, this is also Istanbul Convention, but also the CEDA. If you have any comment on that. The other thing is that we have been talking about the conservative turn um, when we have been discussing these issues in our workshop. We have been talking about Russia and so on, but would you, but on the other hand, we also, as in your cases here, that there are women's organizations being active, both the old one and the new ones, as we've heard. And would you, could you comment on this? Do you think that the con conservative turn, that there has been such a turn in your country, or do you think it's part of sort of general retraditionalization? Uh, so I think we, we just finish off with this very brief comments. Any of you can can uh, comment on this. And uh, I I also wanted to to hear if there is something you would like to add. Just one minute each, including Nathan at the end. Then thank you. First, okay, Galim first. Yeah, yeah. Uh, very few words about my take. Uh, overall, I think the um, very good human rights education may solve, can solve a lot of problems. Because uh, there is uh, gross ignorance or negligence about human rights in general in post-Soviet countries. Yeah, woman, women's rights, the concept of women's rights isn't something different from human rights. It's about, uh, it's about human rights. And people generally misunderstand uh, women's rights as something very extraordinary, as something extravaganza, something like women want, women, women want to reign the world. No, it's about human's rights. It's about very much human's dignity. And I think very good, proper human rights education in secondary schools 
even uh, in kindergarten may, may solve a lot of problems, uh, even in the foreseeable future. I think education is a key. Uh, it's my general comment to, to the questions. Okay, thank you very much. Gunnara, please. Yeah, uh, sorry, I would like to, uh, so a lot to say. Uh, first of all, I would like to um, comment uh, your question, Anne-Marie, about uh, international tools uh, of human rights, especially Istanbul Convention, SIDO. Uh, as for uh, all our Central Asian countries, as I know, uh, they um, approved, joined SIDA, uh, and uh, all of them, are, all countries are reporting periodically. And in Kyrgyzstan, we also um, have this instrument as national, I mean, Istanbul Convention also, but um, probably in terms of documentation of cases uh, of violence, uh, we have some uh, advance now because uh, these uh, templates are developed based on Istanbul Convention and providers were trained, etc., etc. But the result is not there. Uh, I mean, the result uh, uh, vote for actually it was uh, for a scene. So, uh, and as for uh, CIDO, um, CIDO reports are developed not only by state, but also by NGO, uh, civil society organizations. And it's very symptomatic in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, first time when uh, civil society organizations started to work on alternative report, we've got eight reports. Last time, as I know, it was around 10 reports. And uh, I, I uh, address my comments to Janar. Uh, I don't afraid of um, to, to have, uh, let's say, peaceful conflicts or productive conflicts within the civil society organizations. I personally stay for universal design. We have to be different. We have to understand uh, the situation uh, differently uh, based on our life situation, uh, the position uh, uh, in the life. And it's okay. We have not to be consolidated because we are, for example, women or rural people or Kyrgyz people etc etc i do not understand this type of consolidation and i do not believe spending 30 years in civil society organizations as an activist that we can consolidate and be solidar only because of your women uh, right protection uh, protection activist so and um the last one i would like to mention that we um for sure see the signs of conservative turn. Uh, right, right, uh, right now, um, um, the politicians trying in Kyrgyzstan to uh, push um, new um, reduction, let's say, uh, a new uh, version of constitution. And within this, uh, within this constitution, they are imagining that it will not be, uh, of, co of course, circular state. Uh, of course, it uh, should be state which uh, will not assume the free, uh, these fundamental freedoms will be uh, on the place, including freedom of speech, uh, freedom of meetings. It should be um, like monarchy <laughs> from... Uh, Middle Ages. So, and at the same time, we can see the small growth of small uh, atoms, I would say, of very uh, progressive and uh, very interesting things. Uh, Julia uh, can state that in our country, so many interesting initiatives are happening. For example, uh, like exhibition, like um, so many, many things um, which mostly done by civil society uh, organizations and um, civil activists. But the prevalence of conservative tendencies are now really very dangerous. Okay, thank you. 
No school, please. Um, I would agree with uh, Darlene about uh, education. Yes, it's uh, um, give opportunities for young women and they are um, education it's not about only profession but about socialization and i would believe that yes media and um, social networks and even popular culture can give some opportunities on maybe models for young women to to be more independent to be maybe more protective and um, <clears throat> to protect themselves uh, and increase uh, their um, opinions, uh, in, not only maybe in Kazakhstan <laughs> and abroad. So um, yeah, it's um, it's a serious threat about return about survival of traditionalism, but um, I think that young generation is more open and more influenced by different types of media. And so um, they can, I think, they can <laughs> fight for themselves, for their future, for example. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Sorry. Uh, yes, and of course, uh, as uh, we are not the member of Europe Councils, uh, we couldn't uh, sign the Istanbul Conventions, but uh, despite this, uh, a lot of discussions uh, uh, was uh, uh, held in Kazakhstan about uh, to uh, uh, have uh, this uh, <clears throat> concept uh, for implementation in Kazakhstan and a lot of women organizations in Kazakhstan and uh, among those uh, was, which was uh, mentioned in my presentations also uh, support this idea and uh, making a lot of uh, initiatives and uh, some of them are uh, uh, accepted and some of them are uh, even we have the uh, now discussed the laws, uh, the accepting some laws in that direction. So I think that we, of course, we should uh, support in all uh, all agenda of these uh, Istanbul conventions uh, if you want to make progress in the issues of uh, uh, gender equality and uh, women's rights. Uh, and I still believe that inclusion is important now uh, and for understanding to each other and for create more uh, 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 that because the creation of the inclusive uh, environment uh, will give us the, this uh, sense of безопасности. Алом, помогите мне. Security. 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 Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Nathan, please. Uh, yeah, I, I just would like to reiterate that I think a lot of these discussions and debates really need to be brought out more because I think it's very interesting to look at the, the diversity of positions um, and, and uh, there's an organization in Sweden that every year organizes a, a sort of meeting of activists from Central Asia, um, the Central Asian support group. Um, and, and they, it's fascinating to listen to the activists they bring and, and they're, you know, very radically different uh, issues that they're pursuing. And yet they do have a shared sense of we need to change things, we can work together. And this is the way we do it. We sit down and we talk about our experience, our situation, and so on. So I, I, I would just like to underscore that. And, and the same with the question of feminism. I think it's fascinating. And it's not just in Central Asia, obviously. It's in many parts of the world that feminism has gotten a bad name. And yet it's the, the vanguard and the productive edge. And, you know, anybody, um, and it's not just feminism now, but lots of radicals are putting forward the ideas which, you know, uh, the past 
the radicals were the ones who have created what's basically generally accepted now. And so the same is probably happening right now with the radicals. So we also have to uh, work with them and, you know, appreciate what they're attempting to do or what the, at least try to see what their, uh, what their goals are and so on. Um, so I, I think this is a very good kind of way to enter into this. And, and I think it fits very well. Media is obviously a place where we encounter a lot of these ideas. A lot of them these days come across in very twisted forms because they're being thrown up by one conservative faction showing how crazy this, fa this uh, left-wing faction is or a left-wing faction showing how horrible the conservatives are. Um, but the media is the way that's opening up this, this kind of uh, understanding, better understanding. And what hasn't happened quite as much yet is the understanding between regions, like the, the issues in East Asia versus the issues in Central Asia versus issues in Europe. There isn't quite as much discussion, but it, it's it, it, uh, a lot better than it was in the past. There's a lot more people who move among these areas and, and understand the sort of different uh, framings of these uh, situations. So it's, uh, I, I'll just end with that. I think it's uh, all part of a very useful and important and valuable process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Gulnara, you have your, raised your hand. Would you like to have a last comment before we wrap up? No, 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 it was before. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay, but then we have, I mean, this is an ongoing discussion. We could, we could of course, have used a whole day for this uh, mini workshop, but we, we have plans to continue both in the spirit of uh, preparing the book and also that we still have funding for this uh, post-Soviet uh, women uh, workshop that we only had <clears throat> so far online. And we have still the ambition to be able to, to hold it before September last, next, next year in Uppsala, if it's possible. But we, we also plan to have a, a seminar on Kyrgyzstan in, in the spring and we also plan to have maybe another event on Central Asia and women in, in the spring. So I, I can see that there's still a lot of things to discuss. So, but now we have passed uh, our, our uh, deadline for the seminar with about a quarter extra time. But I want to thank you everybody, especially I would like to thank all the speakers and also Nathan for very good discuss, being good discussant. Thank you to Eugenia for helping with the hosting and thank you everybody.